Good evening. Welcome to Community and Technology, where we connect the global community with news, information, and resources. I hope it help improve your life. I'm Stu Reed, and here really? my co-host, Dave Bernstein. Hey, Dave. Really? You think all this broadband and stuff really improves people's lives? You know, that that's a big question. That's a big question. Uh, they're talking in Washington like it's the, the be-all, the end-all. I don't know. What, what are you thinking, Dave? Well, there's lots of good things. I'm obviously addicted to the internet. Jenny gets to watch TV from all over the world. There's now 500 channels on her cable, but as we know, there's nothing to watch in any of them. But by going <laughs> yeah. to the internet and Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and Apple, and what's the name of that one that we're getting from England? Somebody recommends? Oh, Walter, Walter presents. Walter hmm. he's very good Jenny is saying he's really good because he gets all the best of the European TV. Mm -hmm. He does a good job of getting subtitles or dubbing of quality and so on. So you actually can find something to watch because there's an internet. Mm -hmm. You don't know mm -hmm. until, until you don't have it. Because, you know, when I went to stay with my father's house the last time, the internet was off. Uh, then, then you realize how much you depend on. Stu, did Jenny yes. come across there because she's not by the microphone? Uh, I hear her. Uh, she's not crystal clear like you, but I did hear her talking about yeah, she, she was visiting someone and they didn't have the internet wasn't working. And that's when she realized how much she missed it when it wasn't there. Yeah. So yeah. we're not, nobody's pretending the internet is invaluable. Although there's a whole lot of people who can give you some really solid information about how it can ha harm people. Uh, one of the things coming up, I've been spending far too much time this week listening to Washington people and reading what they're saying and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm horrified because the programs they're coming out with, with $62 billion worth of taxpayer money, the question is whether they're going to waste half of it or three quarters of it. And I'm probably being kind. Mm -hmm. the, the, the numbers are astounding, Dave. Uh, you and I were around back in the Obama administration when they uh, had the BTOP program, the Broadband Technology Opportunity Program. And they had two different initiatives, this first term, second term. I think each one was around $3.5 billion, total of 7 or $8 billion. And folks thought that was a lot of money. I, I, I was not impressed with how they actually spent it. You know, we've talked about that on the show before. Uh, but, uh, you know, how so much of it, most of it went to the usual suspects. But now we're an order of magnitude larger than that. Some $60 billion, is it, that's, that's going out the door? Actually, it's going to be over $70 billion when you okay. put it all together. There's so it is, time, it is time for tribal, time. Yeah. and there's... Seven billion from the state of California to mm. build totally unnecessary infrastructure, purely duplicating what's already there, uh, and loads and loads of this stuff. But before no. I get into talking about it, you no, no, should know my bias. This one I have to put up there up front. I tweeted yesterday a very strong recommendation for. Jessica Rosenworcel, who I've known for 22 years, for chairman of the FCC, mm -hmm. and Gigi Sohn, who I've known almost as long, for a spot in the FCC. I happen to be disagreeing with an awful lot of what they're doing lately. They, in fact, have totally lack of understanding of how they're spending some of the money they're recommending being spent and what's going on in the outside world as does almost everybody else in Washington. It's really amazing, the disconnect. But they are darn good, hardworking, brilliant, consumer-focused, honorable people who I've watched for decades, literally, mm -hmm. put everything they have into doing the best possible job they can. Uh, I also said that I understand that Alan Davidson, who's likely to take over the NTIA is highly respected and a good choice, but I couldn't say more than that because I didn't know him very well. So I have bias in favor of the people whose work I'm about to 
to very rude things out of. Mm-hmm. And it's, well, what did they say at the end of uh, Some Like It Hot? Do you remember that line? Mm. Jenny, come over and tell, t- tell him that story. Joey, Joey Brown is the millionaire. I remember that they're, 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 they're in the boat and, uh, and he says something about, oh, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a man. He says, nobody's perfect. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was one of the, the cross dressing act, uh, actors. I think it was Tony Curtis was there. Yeah, Tony and, Curtis and Jack Lemon. Yeah. And Joey Brown, had, you know, Playboy millionaire had fallen in love with him, her. Mm-hmm. And the very last scene of the movie, Jerry Brown is trying to get her to marry him or, so, or, or something. And he says, I have to tell you something. I'm not a woman. And Joey Brown replies, so nobody's perfect. Well, Jessica Rosenworth, who, my, who I very strongly recommend for chairman of the FCC, is not perfect. She's managed to blow much of $5 billion that was allocated to bring broadband to people who didn't have it. And that's the kind of case study of how they get things wrong. Well, let's, let, let's start with what you've seen, Stu. Who doesn't have broadband and what can you do to get them connected? Well, you know, right here in New York City, uh, uh myself, my partner, Doug Frazier, and our community uh, partners have been working for some time to uh, bring broadband to public housing residents, of which there are close to half a million here in New York City, and it's estimated that 50% of them do not have broadband at home. And uh, it's, a, it's been an intractable problem thus far. Uh, I'm hoping that some of the new initiatives uh, both by New York City, which recently uh, announced some funding, as well as the federal programming program that's coming out is going to help ameliorate that. But, you know, the, the, the big issue is, again, you got a quarter of a million people with no Internet at home. And, you know, there have been the, 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 the discount of program has been around for probably close to a decade, and it has not made a dent in this underserved uh, uh, population. And, you know, what I have learned and what we have learned together is that there really has to be a free service available to uh, low-income folks. You you, you can't not, you really can't tell low-income folks that this is a deal, that this price point is affordable for you as opposed to that price point. You have folks that are uh, living at the poverty line, the average income of family income in the New York City public housing is $25,000, right at the poverty line. So these folks are struggling to put food on the table, to keep the kids clothed, to pay for transportation, to pay for uh, medical bills. And even something that looks like maybe it's not a lot of money, $20, $30, $40 a month can be what breaks the household budget in any given month. So it's hard to go to that population and tell them, look at this great deal I got for you, this affordable service. So what we've done, we figured out a way to provide free service to to that segment of the population. And uh, a couple of things happen when you do that, Dave. One, a lot of the folks, you know, have not had internet at home before. So they don't really even know the utility and the value of it until you give it to them. And also, you know, we have uh, worked with them, when I say them, residents in public housing to develop together applications and services that meet their needs as they define it. So when you, when you have folks that can actually embrace the technology and start to use it in ways that make sense for them, that changes the whole paradigm. So that, that's what we've been working on uh, uh, in public housing here in New York City for you know, close to 10 years now. And uh, we're hoping now with some of these new programs uh, that there's gonna be some breakthroughs. But you know, it's, it's a huge underserved population. And you know, so much of the rhetoric in Washington has been about that small, I guess it's less than 5% of folks in rural America that does not have access to broadband. Yet they, until very recently, they've ignored 
the folks in urban America, they have access to it, but you know, it's, it's not, it's not affordable. I mean, it's not at any price point. So, you know, how, how do you, how do you uh, address that problem? I think the emergency broadband benefit program started to do that. And now they're talking about transitioning to another, uh, some sort of uh, uh, affordable uh, uh, plan. So I'm hoping that these subsidies are at least a recognition of the fact that there is a big divide in urban America. And it has to do with, uh, you know, what folks have to pay for the service. Okay. The first one you mentioned was the emergency broadband. That came through early in the pandemic with $5 billion, Mm -hmm. much of which has been spent now in the last year and a half. Its goal was to connect the people who weren't connected. And you listen to all the stuff they were talking about, what they wanted to do, and they said that kids wouldn't have to go to the parking lot of McDonald's in order to connect to the Wi-Fi in order to do their school lessons. Powerful imagery. Nobody expressed it better or more often than Jessica Rosenworcel. Now, of that $5 billion, what percent do you think has been spent connecting people who weren't already connected? Who were not already connected? Yep. I would hope at least maybe 50%. I don't really know. I'm just hoping. Well, you don't really know because they deliberately never found out, even though reporters like the Los Angeles Times and me have tried to get an answer on this subject. The real answer is under 20% and probably under 10%. Wow. That's how bad the program went. What wound up doing is they didn't have any effective communication with the people who really needed it. And so the people who signed up, they had quite generous terms. You could be up to twice the poverty line. Uh, You could uh, have uh, even more income, over $100,000, if you certified that your income had been cut because Mm. of COVID and the Mm. pandemic and so on. Mm. It was really easy to qualify. Probably a third of the country could qualify. $5 $5 billion is a lot. It's enough to connect at the rates that Comcast or T-Mobile are willing to charge the poor, which was a separate fight and a good one. Uh, that's uh, eight per thousand, 8,000 per million. 8 million people? Yeah. Mm. Enough to connect 8 million people. Mm -hmm. If it got to 10th of that, I'd be amazed. But I don't know because there is nothing whatsoever in the program that ever determined whether the people signing up were already connected. Wow. Even when people- That's a a travesty right there. Right. Now, of course, the reason they didn't add that one simple question, which, yeah, sure, some people would lie about it and could be misleading occasionally, into the sign-up procedure, which is fairly complicated, uh, was they didn't want to know because they saw early on that they might fail, and in fact, they have. Mm. What happened was that some middle-class people or poorer people who could use the help signed up for the the, the $50 a month benefit. Then... Companies who had people signed up, notably Comcast in California is the one that made the press, said to all their people who were signed up for their $10 program, a very generous, good program that Comcast has, and said, if you just fill out this form, the feds will pay us $50 and we'll keep your broadband going. You don't even have to pay us the $10. And uh, that company... Mm-hmm. And a lot of their customers willing to take that deal. Result, somewhere upwards of 80% of the money, maybe even 90%, went to bringing down the cost for people who are already connected. It's not a bad thing, especially if it's mostly going to poor people. 
help support but people. It's, but it sounds like the bulk, the bulk of the money did not subsidize. The bulk of the money went to the providers. Uh, if it I'm went hearing to you the right. providers about twice as much as they would have charged. Mm -hmm. We had on this show Scott Walston. He was the chief economist of the U.S. broadband plan 10 years ago. He's the best economist working on this stuff in Washington. We have good guests mm -hmm. on this show. I mean, we know, we, we know who's who. In God. Scott figured out that the right price should have been about $15 a head. I was more generous. I said $20, $25 a head. Networks are really expensive to build, but once they're bu built, bandwidth and everything else is cheap, doesn't cost much to add a customer. Mm -hmm. Cost for Verizon to add a customer or Comcast or Charter or Spectrum or Altice or whoever to an existing cable or wireless network is somewhere between four and eight dollars a month. So if the government was buying for eight million people, what price should they get? Scott figured $15 is a company who make a small profit. And it's the kind of thing that you have to be very competitive on or somebody will get the contract away from you. I looked around and I said, maybe 20, 25. Well, the folks who wrote the legislation in the first place said 50 with no basis, no record, no research. And basically they asked the companies, well, how much are you charging? We want to make sure everybody can be connected. And they came in at 50. Mm -hmm. Now I actually asked the FCC, how are you, how are you going to bring that down to the 15 or 25 or 30 that makes sense? And they said, we can't do anything about it. That's what Congress said. And that wasted half the money right there, paying too much. Mm -hmm. They had gone to Comcast and T-Mobile and so on and got bids. The bids would have been 15 to 25 dollars. That's one of the things that getting dead wrong in the next 42 million. But eventually the word got to Congress. The folks in Congress on this, liberal and conservative, are not crooks by and large. There's some crooks in Congress, but they're not driving this stuff. There, many of them are ideologues. Many of them have very close ties to the players in this, including Many of them are owned by the phone companies, Verizon, Comcast, uh, AT&T, mm -hmm. and Google, Facebook, and Amazon all have literally $100 million a year influence operations in Washington. They pay their top people? Well, David Cohn of Comcast made $18 million one year. And we know that because it showed up in the financial Bible. Loads of their people that are applying the influence are making numbers like $5 million. When you see a, a top lawyer signed off on the petition for T-Mobile to uh, buy Sprint, you know that top lawyer is costing $5 million a year, something like that. Mm -hmm. That's the going rate. Okay, and for that kind of money, you get some really good influencers. The best of them don't even have to lie. Verizon used to be really good on that. David Young is still there. He could find the one fact out of 20 that suggests his point of view is right and play it up and get you convinced that this is so important. So for, he was the board of the best lobbyists I know. His boss, Tom Kauke, was similar. Uh, they were so good, they didn't have to lie. Mm -hmm. Most of these folks lie right and left. And they have so many voices repeating what they say, and so much power to influence, and are chosen because they're so effective at influencing people. For $5 million, you get a really good liar. I call them the two plus two equal four gang. <laughs> so, so no, Dave, what, 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 what influence have these folks had on the current uh, 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 infrastructure bill that's coming down the, the 60 or 70 well, billion? Well, one dollars. of the good things is that, as I say, most of these people, Republicans and Democrats, want to do a decent job, don't want to waste public money. They've been influenced by some of the best. Some of them have been bought and paid for, but fewer than you'd think. 
the way you do this in, in, in Washington, and I've watched the pros do it for 22 years now, is you treat them like honest people and you find out what they're going to listen to. You make sure they hear it again and again and again from everybody you can get. It's mm -hmm. going to persuade them. Okay, so the word got down that in this new bill, they brought it down to $30 subsidy. $30 is a little bit more than the price I would expect them to pay if they got bids from the big companies that dominate this all. But it's a lot less than $50. Mm -hmm. And they're a little bit stricter on who gets the money. So the one thing that's in $20 billion of the $62 billion is going to go to let almost every single one of those 250,000 people in public housing who are connected get $30 towards the connection. And if they don't foul it up, and we know what SNAFU really stood for, that F, mm. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, T-Mobile and probably Verizon Mobile and Comcast and the other cable companies, for that $30 will give them a decent connection. That's a good deal. And that is something that is helping the unconnected people. If you reach out to them and make sure that this program works for them and is helping the poor who may be connected now, but are more likely than not struggling. Not such a terrible way to do it. The other $42 billion, where's that going to go? Well, when they wrote the bill, they thought that that money was necessary to connect these poor people in rural areas that nobody ever got to before. And there are something on the order of 3% of the American population who can't get anything except satellite. Mm -hmm. And another maybe 2% of the American population who have things like really slow old DSL. Upgrading most of those is a sensible thing if you want to get more people connected. And that's going to that would cost to get to the U.S. from 95% available to 99% available, about 10 of the $45 billion that's allocated to it. Wow. Okay. And I've worked on rural broadband in Vermont on a project. And I've met with 15, no, for 20 years, people building. I've consulted them a lot. I've looked at the numbers. I worked on the broadband plan, which had primary numbers on it. That's about what it would take. But somebody who happens to be brilliant, name is Paul Desaw. He was a chief of staff at the FCC or something like that. Have you do an analyst? PhD in physics, I think turned around and came up with a number of $80 million to connect people. And he got that number by taking some numbers from the companies and some of them, I think he, well, I don't know where he got all his numbers because he never documented it. It never was published in anything that anybody reviewed. I've actually gone over and it and, and it was five years out of date on stuff whose costs have been coming all the way down. Uh, I've been speaking to him, and I think he privately acknowledges to me that the number should have been cut at least in half. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to say that he publicly acknowledges that, and we weren't explicit about it. He wasn't on the record, but he knows. But they had this auction for Spectrum that raised $70 million. So some of the people in Congress said it's going to cost $80 million to do it. we got a reputable source that we know and respect. And he's a good, honest, liberal, brilliant guy. Uh, so let's try to get that to make sure we have plenty. And they wound up coming up with 60 billion. And then some people started turning around. What was the name of the Times reporter we had on the show here? Mm. Do you remember? No, I don't. Okay. Um, I have to look it Times, up. Dave. Yeah. Times reporter 
talked to a number of people, including Paul Dessau and Blair Levin, uh, who had looked closer, more closely at the data and realized that there were two problems with the first program. The first is it was spending $70 billion on connecting the 3% or 5% in rural areas that needed the connection. Whereas two thirds or three quarters of the unconnected was sitting there in New York City in places like that where they could get a connection and they just didn't have the money. So a sensible thing was done by the people in Congress they took 20 billion of the 62 billion they were talking about at that stage and said, we'll use it to subsidize the people who don't have connection. So you, Stu Reed, who has worked on this stuff in Harlem in the Bronx for 25 years or so, maybe more, can put together a program that just using the $30 the feds will pay you for each person you connect could connect 200,000 of those people. And that money is there. That's not a bad thing, especially if you get spent that way. It won't. Mm -hmm. There's lots of details involved, but it's a darn good business for, Stu, could you deliver a uh, wired service into New York City housing projects that you could make money on at $30 a head? You know, I'm, I'm sure you could. I'm sure one could. You know, the, the, the issue. I'm is, sure you could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 you know, the, the big issue is, you know, uh, getting market share going up against the behemoths like Verizon, LTs and Spectrum. That, 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 that's, that's the real uh, gorilla in, in, in the room in that, you know, business model. Well, since the Spectrum and Verizons and Comcast haven't done very much in poor neighborhoods, you may have a learn, and then you have to get to another problem. Many of the unconnected people, even if you gave it to them for free, aren't really ready for it. What would happen if you got a grant from New York City, and I know you're working with New York City on some projects, so don't talk about anything you shouldn't, that said, let's try this building and New, and New York City will pay you to connect everybody in the building for free or everybody who doesn't already have a connection. How many of those people will put that connection to good use? You know, I, you know, it's been my experience that folks need a lot of help in terms of how to use the internet, uh, what the utility is, what the value is, and ways that they can use it that is productive for them. So you can't just dump the connection on them and think, oh, everything is going to be fine now. There's a, there's a lot of support. There's a lot of training. There's a lot of education. Uh, so the other pieces that have to go along with that program, you just can't, uh, you know, here's the bandwidth and think that that's going to solve the problem. It's not. Um, you know, I'd like, we're going to do another show, Dave, uh, once kind of things shake out. And I'd like to come back and talk in further detail because I can't really talk now about what we're going to be doing with our group. But uh, we will absolutely have another show uh, where we're going to have bring in some of the uh, residents of some of the teams, uh, members that are working with us to, uh, to tackle this problem and going to go into it in, in, in more depth at that point in time. Now, we had John Horrigan. Mm -hmm. One of the top people in Washington on this, who's been working on it since before the broadband plan a decade ago on the radio show to talk about this as well. Right. What did you take away from what he said about what it would take to make the programs work? You know, I, I, a couple of things. One, uh, you know, it, you really got to educate the, the end users. You got to, uh, uh, you know, give them skills as to, how to use the, uh, the, the broadband. Um, you know, I, I think I, I can remember he and I, you know, going back and forth. And I, I think he kind of agreed with, 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 with my assessment. And that is that uh, you just can't give the folks uh, a connection, folks that have historically been denied, historically been underserved, historically have not been connected. Uh, you just can't 
uh, dump connectivity on their laps and expect that they will pick it up and run with it because, you know, they, they won't. They don't know how to use it. So there, there, there's a huge education piece that has to go along uh, with the access piece. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that was the long and short of, of, of what he said. And well, yes, sir, that was a big part of it. But I got some tough questions about that one. The other thing is he said that you have to effectively communicate in ways that the people understand and will listen to. Mm -hmm. And that almost always comes from having the people who are on the ground, who understand right. the people who need help, often who have lived with them and come from them, as opposed to the folks who are going to have $5 billion of our public money to try to get on the radio and say, Birdband is really important and it will change your life. You will be able to see your doctor on the screen. Oh, right. yeah, absolutely, Dave. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's that been the mantra, my mantra, my group's mantra. And, and yes, Horrigan definitely uh, gave us a cosign on that, that it has to come from the ground up because the top-down solutions just don't work. Uh, the folks on the top don't understand uh, the needs or concerns. They don't have the mindset. So you really need folks on the ground uh, that, that help define what they're going to get, how they're going to get it, how they're going to use it. And, you know, one of the things that, that, that we want to, that, that we're doing is the folks on the ground are actually involved in the actual provision of the service. So that it's not a third party, it's not top down, it's actually the folks on the ground involved in, in installing, configuring, and operating the services that they receive. That changes the paradigm when that happens. Well, sometimes it does. And I think it's by and large an absolute minimum to make the program work. Mm -hmm. I haven't, but we're gonna take a break in a moment. When we come back, I'm going to ask you to think of examples of programs that worked. There have been literally hundreds of programs. There were dozens funded 10 years ago with the broadband stimulus. How many of them got it right and made it work? And what, what was involved in the ones who made it work? Because frankly, I've got in front of me the plans for the state digital Equity plan, $60 million. Mm -hmm. The state capacity grants, $1.44 billion, $240 million a year. The requirements for what the governor, the digital equity competitive grants, the requirements for who the governor has to consult and what, it's the, 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 what they want to happen. And it doesn't look like anything that's going to work. Yeah. Okay. Well, we will talk about that side, that on the other side of the break. Uh, you're listening to Community and Technology on WHCR 90.3 FM, The Voice of Harlem. Stu Reed and Dave Burstein. We'll be right back after a brief musical break. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, we're back. Uh, this is Community of Technology. We were just listening to a little Autumn in New York with saxophonist Dexter Gordon. But Dave Burstein, a stew reader back uh, with Community of Technology on WHCR 90.3. Uh, before the break, Dave, we were talking about uh, the big infrastructure, broadband infrastructure spend coming down from Washington. And I, I think you were posing the question as to when, when have we seen that work in the past? Is that, well, is that your question? Let, let's just talk about the digital literacy training, persuading to adopt, getting people involved to use the program well. How often have you seen, of, of the hundreds of programs out there, how often have you see, seen them work? Not very often. Um, you know, I, 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 I guess my, my biggest familiarity is with the programs that I've been actually associated with directly myself. I know that, uh, you know, we instituted a number of them back in the, in, in the early 2000s, uh, community-based programs where we established a, a learning center in the South Bronx where we had uh, actual uh, computers that were uh, given to residents and free broadband connections, and we brought them in and had actual workshops. Uh, uh, the residents were required to take the workshops to get the free computer and the connection, and it, and it worked. Uh, you know, it, we only ran it for about two years. I think uh, the program ran out of funding, but it was a model that I saw uh, that worked. People got devices. They were required to take a minimum amount of training, how to use the devices, how to navigate on the internet, and you had, uh, you know, I can remember seniors coming in there, bringing their grandkids with them to help them learn during the workshop. So, you know, I, I saw with my own eyes that it could work, it did work, uh, but you had to take the time, you had to be patient, you had to do some real hands-on hand-holding, and uh, that worked. Um, you know, I. I can't speak to any national models because I, I don't know of any where, where, where that worked. Uh, another program that I know that worked. There's actually, let, let, let's hold there because okay. it makes the point. What you're saying is it can work. And I agree with that because throughout my life in computers, which is far too many decades, I've discovered that people do want the advantages and it's pretty obvious to most people that the internet is, can be pretty useful. You can't get it dated in most communities if they can't check you out on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a much more powerful incentive than you can, you, you, than, well, you might be able to talk to a doctor specialist in Idaho uh, instead of going to your local physician or local emergency room, which sometimes is valuable, but that's not what persuades is going to persuade people. Uh, it was wonderful, and I've seen it again and again, for old folks to be able to talk to their relatives who aren't there. Mm -hmm. When Jenny got her father, who was then 96, connected out of network, and they could do video calls, she couldn't get them off the phone. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, they're 2,000 miles away. He wanted it once he saw and could do it. Mm -hmm. He really wanted it. And then when she went out to Colorado and hooked him up so that he could listen to his church services on Sunday, mm -hmm. the church he had gone to for 40 years, 50 mm -hmm. years, and couldn't get out of the house to go to anymore, mm -hmm. but it was broadcast, he loved that. So the internet can be a thing of joy. It less often is practical, it sometimes is. It's absolutely essential if you're going to do remote education, and that's the situation in this country. And we got Omicron coming now. I wouldn't want to go into a school building if I could help it. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of things. So the interest is mostly there. Now, the one barrier that is very clear that can make a difference is the cost. And the reason I say it is the most successful program by far that I've seen, this Comcast program, which gave people a cheap computer, 
under 50 hour Chromebook or something like that, had some kind of training, especially because it worked for the schools, used the schools for outreach to let people know that the program was on and use the teachers to communicate through the kids to the parents and brought the course down to $10 a month. And I don't know how many million have signed up. T-Mobile is having the same program. Again, using the schools, getting the resources that are actually out there, talking to the people, uh, bringing the cost all the way down. Uh, and this, those programs worked. Now, how much that's the bringing down the cost and how much is that education is necessary? I was dubious, but the people at Comcast said it really made a difference, just like you're saying. Mm -hmm. So you need both. You need to make it affordable, which this program keeps talking about, and the people in charge of this program keeps talking about, but when you get into the details, isn't doing it except where the $30 is going to do it. Uh, and you have to let people know about it, and if possible, you can give them some help. Now, do you think if you would offered advanced adult education, uh, that would get more of the people who are unconnected connected? Well, you know, I said if, advanced if, because that was one of the things that was being expected of people getting the grants. It that doesn't cover sound, it doesn't sound and very advanced interesting, skills. Dave. It, do, it doesn't sound appealing. Uh, you know, that it doesn't sound like something that people would jump at. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't like the I don't like what you're calling it. Not that you're calling it that, uh, uh, you know, how do you characterize it and what is it? Uh, I think you got to make it a heck of a lot more attractive. And again, I, you, you got to meet people on the ground. Uh, you know, I, I think people on the ground need to be devising these type of programs as opposed to the folks in their ivory towers uh, deciding, oh, here's an education program for you. Um, oh, I, th you mean I think that's not going to work. Oh, let's talk about what this program does. The governor has to appoint a group that applies to the feds for the feds to approve them. They can't spend more than 20% of the money on their own administration and talking to each other. They can have as many contractors do it, the work as they choose, mm -hmm. but they can't directly spend more than 20%. Mm. And you have to evidence that you have consulted all these institutions out there or public hearings, you have to document what people said at the public hearings and then show whether or not you've incorporated into the program. But how many people working in the state government, in any state government, are likely to understand how to get out there and persuade somebody who doesn't know how to use a computer, if you're lucky as literate, may have a kid in school and wants to help the kid, probably works two jobs if they're working, doesn't have much funds, have lots of issues that are more important in their life, like maybe we don't have enough money to feed my kid, which is the people we're talking about, often it's real concern, or I don't, I'm about to lose a tooth because I can't afford to pay the dentist to save it. How many of the people in government who are approved by the governor and are able to consult with 16 different branches of government, which I, I saw in one of these proposals, are likely to also know how to do it, get work with poor people in the field who aren't at all like them? Few to none, David, is the answer to the question. But uh, you, what you're describing, is this an actual a proposed program under, under this infrastructure plan? What, 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 what are you uh, uh, citing? That is exactly what $5 billion of the infrastructure plan intends to fund. Jeez, wow. They just gave $5 billion upfront, $100 million to each state for essentially any program the state wants to do, starting with planning grants. And I'm pulling some of these requirements out of the rules. 
The next mm -hmm. stage is that Alan Davidson and God knows who else will come up with a long document called the NOFA, Notice of Funds Availability, that says if you want to apply for this money, this is what you have to do. Uh, they have 180 days to do that, incidentally, which is why it was really important that they got, got the people who are going to be in charge signed up. People who are covered in the program NTA, I have no idea what they're talking about. The political appointees who have no background in any of this. Mm. And then after spending much of that $100 million in each of 50 states planning things, there's another $5 billion coming to the programs that these people will put together. And none of it, it all smells like the $500 million that a very good guy who was personally very friendly to me, it was a big meeting where I said, you know, do you think so-and-so question? I'm a reporter, I get to ask people questions. And he said, you know, Dave, you're one of the good guys. But I also was turning around and saying he was wasting most of the $500 million. When I looked into the details of the program, he had a broadband adoption program that was the, the best designed to evaluate of anything I'd seen. It took, it worked with different Chicago school districts and some of them got money for adoption, some of them didn't. How many, the places that got money for adoption, how well do you think that worked in getting more people to connect? I would say probably not well, just knowing how government works, but I don't know. It really was fewer. Fewer? There were fewer people connecting where they had an expensively funded program on adoption. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. Okay. And when I looked at so many others, I saw almost none. So what's happening here is you have a lot of well-meaning people who listen to some folks like you who knew what needed said you got to talk to the community you got to get people involved and wrote up some nice sounding stuff that isn't going to do anything on the ground in most cases mm. i had this out with the lady in charge of the program in maine they wanted to do a whole lot there, there's a lot of talk about putting back all the middle mile in it turned out that didn't work at all. Again, Paul Tissar was in it. Uh, he's just a brilliant physicist who didn't happen to know what was going on in the field in Birdbath. And he's like a lot of brilliant people. He's so smart that he often has been able to solve problems without knowing the details. And he meant well, but he got it all wrong. Mm. Uh, back all. And I spoke to... Uh, one of the best people in Washington, Chris Lewis at Public Knowledge. And I said, where are the examples of these middle mile programs that have worked so well? And he said, go take a look at Maine, where they had a project that I wrote about 10 years ago called the Three Ring Binder, because of how it looked and where the wires were, that ran fiber across a lot of communities in Maine. So I got a hold of the woman who was in charge of the program you say, said, this is one that worked. And I said, what were your successes? How many unserved people were connected? And she said, well, we gave so and so much money to this group. And we supported this program in this city. And we've seen these five companies come up that were connecting people in Maine. And I said, and how many unserved people did you connect? And she said, well, we gave out a lot of money for that purpose. And I said, and how many unserved people didn't you connect? And she said, that's not the important question. Jeez, <laughs> you know, so often governments uh, uh, way to solve problems to throw money and not even monitor the results of throwing that money. Just the throwing of the money is like the solution somehow. Yeah, this is not a woman who I have any reason to think was taking kickbacks from the people she mm -hmm. gave money to. She was well, an so intelligent it, it, woman who really mind, wanted to mind, connect people. It's a problem-solving mindset. Throw money at it and that's going to fix it. And that's what happened 
here, encouraged by literally a billion dollar lobbying set up by the giant companies and some of the smaller phone companies Mm -hmm. who want to get their piece of it, informed by an army of thousands of consultants who have worked on projects like this and want more projects like this, all of whom believe they're doing good work, bringing broadband or better broadband to people who don't need it. And they're about as likely to find success as the people posting, recommending drinking bleach in order to cure COVID. (laughs) Wow. Which many yeah. people believe. No, I shouldn't say drinking bleach. On that, not too many people believe that, you know, nobody except the president of the United States. Uh, that ivermectin, a sta- standard animal deworming drug, would cure COVID. And the data, because there was one little study where they had, you know, 22 people and two more who were cured who were in the ivermectin group. And uh, on the basis of that, they say we have the cure for COVID. Uh, and we know who was promoting ivermectin. Uh, and it has been studied very extensively by good people. And there's no evidence that has any significant effect. And that really was teaching me how people can lie to themselves to believe they're doing the right thing, mm-hmm. that their ideas are right, The psychologists have been saying it and proving this so many different ways for decades. And it really hit home when I saw it. We all saw it with the Trump regime. And I'm seeing it now with good, ethical, honorable people who are trying to help the poor people who they've never met and don't know by and large. Mm -hmm. Get connected, thinking that they're gonna change people's lives with the internet connection which happens sometimes, but not very often. And that all they have to do is get out there and bring what they know and their expertise to these people who are being treated like a conquered province, are being given the respect that the Belgians gave the inhabitants of the Congo. Mm. Wow, wow. Well, well, Dave, uh, <laughs> on that note, I think we got to wind this conversation up, but I, I certainly agree with you. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the solution uh, that has been tried and true, I mean, not, not, not true, but certainly tried again and again, throw money at the problem. And uh, when there's an issue and, and it doesn't work, well, we spent this amount, we spent that amount. I don't know what's wrong. It should have worked. You know, we spent the money. Uh, but you and I know that that is not the solution. And, uh, you know, we're going to be monitoring this situation. When I say situation, broadband spin, the infrastructure spin, and we're going to be talking about it. And hopefully we're going to be able to pull in some of the folks on the ground here in New York City that are working on this uh, from, the, from the ground. Oh, you mean the ones who wanted me to come to the Bronx? I think I sent you that invitation. Yeah. Uh-huh. Where they go in and put a Wi-Fi antenna on the roof and say there are 10,000 people living in the four buildings we connected and they're all gonna hook up to our Wi-Fi uh, and suddenly we'll have the internet and that will transform their education and telehealth and so on. Yeah. When I ask these same people in the buildings they have, how many subscribers they're actually in, you know, what was the connection rate? Well, we're just getting started. We don't really have numbers like that yet. <laughs> okay. Well, that this... is... I could have gone to hear a congressman explain what wonderful work they were doing. Mm-hmm. And these are well-meaning liberal people who are trying to help people. Mm-hmm. But that's not the solution to the problem. No, uh, that's not the way home. Okay, well, we're, we're going to continue to talk about this. Uh, you know, we certainly have some other ideas about how to solve some of these uh, issues. This has been uh, Dave Burstein of Stu Reed, Community and Technology on 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. Stay tuned next week, every Wednesday, 5 to 6 p.m. You just might learn something. Thanks for tuning in. Good night. Thanks, Dave.